Let my people go. Is there an echo? <laughs> Moses repeatedly says this to Pharaoh in our travel through Exodus and looking at Moses. Let my people go is the message that God gives him. You see many miracles and we might call them plagues that God has Moses tell Pharaoh about some a couple of days ahead, some that just happen naturally. And today we're going to talk about the why behind these miracles. And so I have them listed here. I'm going to show them there. Oh, one more. All right. So last week we talked about turning a staff into a snake and the Nile into blood. But you know, if you don't send frog, no, uh, frogs, gnats and lice, flies, ah, cool. uh, the death of livestock, boils on the people, hail and fireballs, locusts, darkness, and the firstborn are all the plagues in Exodus. Each time. Well, starting off, Moses and Aaron, as we heard last week, Moses and Aaron go, and Aaron's the one who drops the staff and turns it into the snake. Um, Aaron's the one, through, through God speaking to Moses, Aaron is the one who helps the Nile turn to red. And in this story, it's a story not only of Pharaoh, but Moses. As these things keep happening as there is um, miracles being worked and Moses sees these. Moses, if you remember back in the burning bush, he says, who am I, God? And who are you, God? And as he starts to think and see what God is doing, it turns a corner somewhere around I think it's gnats and, and lice or so, Moses is the one who starts to extend his hands. Moses is the one starting to go without Aaron to Pharaoh. Moses is still always God's servant, but is coming into the leader of his people. I think it's hard for us as a 21st century person to think about polytheism. Um, I'm not endorsing it, by the way, but a polytheistic society the Egyptians were. And so in a, in a, in a multi-god society, they would go to a god to help with the crops. They'd go to a god to help with the water. They'd go to a god to help have a child or babies born for, for fertility. And the message that God is sending, let my people go, is a complex one. Because God, as it says in the scriptures, is hardening Pharaoh's heart. So Pharaoh, in turn, because of God, really can't say, um, sure, sure, I'll, I'll do this. He's, he's getting harder and harder, hard-headed, if you want, or hard-hearted, um, if you want to say that, um, as each of these plagues come about because God wants to send a message not only to Pharaoh but a multifaceted message to Egypt and to the world as we look at these plagues specifically the Egyptians viewed the Nile as a god it gave them life and water and they detested blood. It was icky. It was unclean to them. And so for their clean, nice source of fresh water to be turned to blood was a message to that God. The fertility God actually in Egyptian culture had the head of a frog. And in Egyptian culture at the time, because of that, the Egyptians were not supposed to kill frogs. And so when you have a plague of frogs coming and frogs are on my food and frogs are on my table and frogs are on my feet and frogs are all over the place, 
I can't kill him because it's against the law. It's a pretty, pretty interesting message that God is sending to the Egyptians, the fertility God. There's a God that of, of the Egyptians that had a head like a fly. There's gods of the livestock and of the harvest. All of these plagues are designed to help one message happen. I am that I am. I am God. There are no other gods before me. Do you see this God that you pray for to fertility? Well, that's just an idol. There's no real power there, Egyptians. And the Israelites being there for the 400 years um, as slaves, and, and there maybe they started believing some of these different superstitions, if you will, in a polytheistic society. Maybe the question Moses asked in the bird and tree bush, who are you? Which God are you? Is a little more layered than we might think in our 21st century thought process. So not only do these plagues show Pharaoh that I am, that I am, that I am the one true God, that I am Yahweh, but it shows the Egyptians that their prayers to false idols, <coughs> to false gods, are nothing more than words. When Moses starts predicting hail is going to come from the sky, he says it in, oh, when is it, chapter 9 or so, he tells the people first, get your livestock, bring them inside, get your servants, bring them inside so that they will not be rained down with this hail and eventually fire. And what happens is God is giving opportunity at this point for redemption for those Egyptians. Those who have seen these signs and who have um, tried to pray to their gods of frogs and gnats and flies and other idols who might have seen that I am that I am are given chances to save their, their people. And Pharaoh's message starts to change at that time in a way that his advisors, the magicians, the sorcerers who could produce a snake, who could produce, you know, turning that, that water into to bloody water, they couldn't produce other things. They couldn't produce gnats from dust. They couldn't produce other things. But they started to, to flip and say, you, you, you know what, Pharaoh? Uh, uh, the, the frogs and, and the lice and all these things, this disease and all of our livestock dead, our, our country's in ruin right now. Let his people go. And so Pharaoh starts to change a little bit of this message. I think I, I put it up here in the... In the um, slideshow. Exodus 9 13 through 21 Then the Lord said to Moses, get up early in the morning and go confront Pharaoh and say to him this is what the Lord says. Say, say to him, this is what the Lord, the God of the Hebrews says. Let my people go so that they may worship me. For this I will send to you the full force of my plagues against you and against the officials and your people so that all you may know that there is no one like me in all the earth. For by now, I could have stretched out my hand and struck you and your people with a plague that would have just wiped you off the earth. But I have raised you up for this very purpose, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. You still set yourself against my people and will not let them go. Therefore, at this time tomorrow, I will send the worst hailstorm that has ever fallen on Egypt from the day it was founded till now. Give an order now to bring your livestock and everything you have in the field and a place of shelter because the hail will fall on every person and animal that has not been brought in and is still out there in the field and they will die. These officials of Pharaoh who fear the word of the Lord hurried to bring their slaves and their livestock inside. 
But those who ignored the word of the Lord left their slaves and livestock in the field. It is not just an I told you so message that God's going for here. It's a repent. Amen. It's a let go of your idols that are before you because I am that I am. The hail was not directed towards the servants or the livestock that was still alive after the plague with the livestock. That hailstorm was directed towards the barley, towards the fields that were going to be destroyed through it. Uh, the commentary I read said that all of these plates from start to finish took probably around 10 months. And so they're not like happening day after day after day. It's weeks and months after months of this next plague, this next miracle that happens. And so Pharaoh, after this hailstorm, starts to change his tune a little bit and says... Do I have that scripture? Oh, who are you, Moses? I already, yeah, we covered that stuff. Go ahead, excellent. It says in Exodus 10, that the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hands toward the sky so that darkness spreads over the Egypt. Darkness can be felt so that Moses stretched out his hands towards the sky and total darkness covered all of Egypt for three days. No one could see or move about for three days. You know, the Israelites had light in places where they lived. Then Pharaoh summoned Moses and said, Go, worship the Lord. Even your women and your children may go with you. Only leave your flocks and herds behind. But Moses said, You must allow us to have the sacrifices and burnt offerings to present to our Lord our God. Our livestock too must go with us. Not a hoof is to be left behind. We have to use some of them in worshiping our Lord and God. And until we get there, we do not know what we are to use to worship the Lord. But the Lord hardened Moses' heart. He was not willing to let them go. Pharaoh said to Moses, get out of my sight. Make sure that you do not appear before me again. Today, you will see my face. You will die. So... Even though Pharaoh's heart is being hardened, he changes his tune a little bit to say no, no, no. He, around the time of the hail, changes and said, yes, the men can go. And as you see, as the time the plague of locusts happened and then uh, the, the darkness here at, at, right in between there says, yes, the women and children can go with you, but not the livestock. It's an illustration that when we follow God, that we need to take our whole selves. It's not a concession part of ourselves. Pharaoh is willing, kind of like a, kind of like Satan, to give a little concession here and say, "Oh, you can let your women and children go, but keep this livestock here." Well. His country is devastating. He has no livestock. Uh, God, throughout this whole, all of these plagues, have the, has God, have God's people been hurt? Have God's people been targeted? Well, you'd think with frogs and lice and flies and livestock and hailstorms coming down from the heavens that God's people have been affected, but no. God's people are set apart for his purpose and his will. God has the power, not that not he's going to do it today, to, to hail down fire on me and then save Vic from, from it, even if we were standing next to each other. He has the power to judge Egyptian or, is, or Israelite. And so what Pharaoh is trying to do is get 
Moses to compromise a little bit. First he offers the men. Go with the men. Keep the women and children here because of course he still needs people for his slaves but Moses knows if the men go that they'll come back. And Pharaoh knows if the men go they'll be back for their women and children. And so in this passage he concedes the women and children can go but the livestock must stay. It's not until the last plague that Pharaoh concedes, if you will, this cry, this cry of Moses, this command by God to let his people go. And so God's message back in the day is our message for us today. God wants your whole heart. He wants all of you. He doesn't want you to concede. And he doesn't want you to have idols before him. What do you make an idol? I don't have any golden calves in my living room. Or maybe I do. Maybe that TV is an idol. Maybe opioids or alcoholism are idols. Maybe workaholism is an idol. Video games, that one's for me by the way. Maybe video games is an idol that people put before God. This one's going to hurt a little bit. Maybe having to be right out of selfish pride is an idol that we put before God. God wants to tear down these idols and show you that I am that I am. He wants you not to compromise and he wants your whole heart to rely on him and his strength. This message that's set as, you know, Jewish strong history, this firstborn plague, the last plague, in, in that, God says that this will be shared for generations to generations that you will put the blood of the lamb on the door so that the firstborn will be spared in your houses and that plague will pass over your home through oral tradition and through centuries Passover since that time has been shared and has been celebrated by the Jewish people in this story, knowing that and highlighting that God is fully in control, that he is powerful, and that he birthed the nation of Israel. But more than that, it is that the I am that I am, and that we don't worship any idols before before him. The firstborn plague is set against Pharaoh, who until that time considered himself a God, so powerful to rule, or his own son is killed. So What's going to be your righteous legacy? Can you stand and throw down the idols in your life at the foot of the cross to allow God to come in? There's something I say in therapy to a lot of people. They're, they're kind of these kind of OCD, maybe kind of perfect kind of people. Um, 
I, I'll, I'll tell them, you know, you know for, for an OCD person, you kind of be like, hey, just relax. Take some time, set some time aside to relax or whatever. But that doesn't work. Because what happens is when we think that we have idle time, we fill it with so many other things. Be still and know that I am God is hard. It is the action. It is the, the thing that we do in that time. It's not, I have this open time to do and fill with all these other things, all these other ideas and idols and things that we put before God. And it's a hard thing to do. Someone was telling me that it's hard to slow down in life. It's hard to put who we were to who we are now. Well, maybe that time needs to be spent with the Lord God. Because that is a fruitful venture 100% of the time. So I ask you today, church, I am sure you're not worshiping frogs and flies and livestock and the, the harvest. But truly, are you worshiping the Lord God Almighty? And what do we set before him in our day? And that message goes not just for Sundays, but for every day of the week. Tomorrow, will you think about the idol that you're putting before you? Or you could be spending time in prayer and worship with God. For Moses, it's all or nothing. Everything's on the line. He, as a small 80-year-old man, stands up to a God. But he has I am at his back. And so do you. If you rely on his strength. So let's pray as we end our service. Consider these things. Consider how you will renew your journey with God today. And what faithful steps you can make to continue to change your heart and make room for I am, for Yahweh. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you. We give you our whole hearts today. We give you it all. In this moment, we cast aside worry and fear. We cast aside busyness we cast aside all the plans that we might have here this afternoon and we just focus in here in this moment on you. Being with you. We give you thanks and praise for getting us this far, God. We praise you and we ask that you help us stay faithful in the next moment, in the next moment, in the next moment, Lord. Help us to pray without ceasing. Help us to give you our whole heart. Help us to be on our knees at the altar of the throne of God inside of us, worshiping you. Today on your Sabbath day, but always. Lord, you would come to earth and you know the busyness and the things that have to get us by in life. And we, Lord, we know we will work faithfully towards those things, but Lord, we pray that those things don't get in the way of our relationship with you. If we can be still and know that you are God. This story, this history of Moses, we, we know is a faithful journey made over months and months. We know that 
Israelites don't get it right the first time either. You know that we fail sometimes, God. But that's okay. Because you know us through and through. And you know that we can step back up and stand for you. Help us, God, in our daily walks. Help continue to point the compass towards Jesus. Remind us and reorient us when we need correction. And help us to not compromise our faith. To stay strong in you. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. You're welcome to come to the altar and pray. Or sit and sing the song. Or stand and sing the song where you are for our closing song.
We thank you for the story of Moses reminding us where our hearts need to be. And help us live a dedicated life to you, Lord. An all-out, sold-out Christian for you. Thank you, God. I pray for those who are kneeling in their hearts, are kneeling. Just Lord, bless them today. Help them see your paths, help them see your ways and your will for their lives. Let them know that there is a God who cares and will help them navigate through the trials and tribulations of this life. Thank you, Lord, for your loving kindness to us. God, I pray a blessing today on this church and on this congregation that you would rise up spiritual gifts inside of us, Lord, to further your kingdom. That through our commitment to you, you will create fruitfulness in the spirit. Helping us grow depth in, in our words and our prayers and help us to grow uh, more and more as a congregation. Continue to point the compass of this church's direction towards you in all of our decisions and all the things that we do, Lord. Please bless us with this morning. I ask this in your holy name. Amen. 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 God bless. You guys have a wonderful week. Yes, Barb? I forgot. Jane called before she left and asked me to have the church pray for her situation at home with her mother-in-law. Okay. So let's pray for Jane's, Jane's mother-in-law. Lord, we thank you so much for Jane and her family and Bob and Lord, we just pray for their family. Strengthen them. Help them today. We pray for her mother-in-law and the situation there. That your hands would be in that and you give them answers and, and healing and anything and wisdom that needs to be done in that in that situation, Lord. Pray for Jane. Encourage her and help her heart. We ask this in your holy name. Any others? All right. Go in peace and serve the Lord.